Okay. So it doesn't say it on my slide, but my name's Jeff Beck, if you didn't hear the first time. And I far I think about consciousness, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so I've sort of outlined what my thought process going to a presentation I'm working on. So yeah, what's, how do we encode meaning in our brain? I mean, that's a big question. Most people don't have good answers for mostly, but the, just the, the words, dual aspect monism, are a high level construction that we've made that most people don't, aren't familiar with, but we might be more in the future. Uh, it's built with language, which is an object system, which is not the continuum from which we arise. It's, a, it's an abstraction. It's a discrete version of reality. It's not. It's not what's really real. It's a. It's a level removed from what's real, essentially, through language. And we have experiences that are very hard to put into words sometimes, and all of consciousness. It was mostly outside of words. There's a little, I mean, we have our language, and a lot of people who do philosophy and like to talk a lot use lots of words. <laughs> and, and I sort of zone out a lot of times when I hear lots of words because it all starts to sound the same after a while. But what's the reality underneath those words? But anyway, and so, but the, so the, the words do have meaning that we construct from our context of a continuum of experience. So that's my starting point on this, if that makes any sense, hopefully. So my background and why I'm interested in this and why I'm interested in transhumanism stems from, I worked as a research engineer for Conoco doing cold slurry and horizontal drilling and whatever they brought to us nobody else could figure out they'd have us brainstorm about is there some way to deal with this problem that's outside the box basically nobody's been able to figure out yet it was really quite a bit of fun because we were always trying to deal with things other people considered to be impossible so I sort of got fixated in my 20s on really liking impossible problems so that's why I like this one so well uh, and I got really interested, we were building pilot plants that had feedback loops and different kinds of control systems to make them run on autopilot. And so I got really interested in, in how you set up self-regulating systems and you know, I was putting it together on a, on a daily basis at work and you know, some of them worked on air because we, some of our work was in the refinery setting and everything had to be explosive proof. So, for safety considerations, you can do this with air, or hydraulics, or digital computers, or a lot friendlier, other than the electrical part. Which, if you're doing it in a coal mine underground and 2% methane, <laughs> figure out some way to do it. If it doesn't involve electricity, it's better. <laughs> okay. Anyway. And. The thing that really got me interested in consciousness was I was just walking along one day and all of a sudden just in one waveform, whatever, it was different. I, I did a master's degree in system dynamics and controls and so I learned how to do abstractions of control systems pretty thoroughly. And the only, I mean it really got my attention because all of a sudden it was, just, for some reason everything was different. And I couldn't explain it. Uh, and the best I could, I came across an explanation called non duality, which sort of looks like that. <laughs> it's this thing, I mean, it gets tangled up with lots of words from our language system mysticism. Uh, there's lots of Eastern religions have ideas of, and Mormonism. They don't talk about it a lot from what I've ever encountered in my life growing up, but surely Joseph Smith knew it well, because otherwise he wouldn't have had to 
experiences and the motivation to do what he did. But it's a it's a different modality of consciousness can somehow take place. It's, what what the heck is this, you know? Because for me it was it wasn't. There were things that were precursors and there were things that happened at that moment and then lots of other stuff that I've noticed Okay, now this is different, this is different, this is different than what it was before. And so it really got me curious about, you know, with science, we should be able to make up better stories than we made up 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. I mean, the history of the, these kinds of experiences go back through shamanic traditions. And I mean, our whole society has been organized by something coming forth into our consciousness that's driving evolution in our social systems that I don't think is accidental. So, but for most people who experience it, it's very accidental. So, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something that could be more thoroughly understood. It just, whenever you start to talk about what is consciousness, people have a really hard time defining that. And as a controls engineer, I but felt, it, I mean, it has a particular place in a dynamic system. And so what that experience did is it really got me interested in consciousness and I've kind of covered a lot of this territory, but What was, I was involved in leading up to that triggering event was trying to under, I was trying to understand individuation processes, was trying to understand inhibitory and drive systems that enter into consciousness and, and tweak consciousness and steer us one way or another because obviously within consciousness we have likes, dislikes, and, and they're all subjective things. They're not, there are some logical people out there where it's objective, but for the most part it's the objective stuff is created by the left brain to make up a good story about what the right brain wants to do that has nothing to do with logic and the normal logic pathways, what we consider logic. And so I did a lot of reading for a couple of years. This was in the context of 2000, the end of 2008 through 2009. 2010 when the economy was in the toilet. Lots of people were bummed out. There was lots of, I mean, I was having a hard time focusing on the farm work because what's the point if it's not going to make any money anyway? And those are the, the changes that take place in those experiences really tear down your drive system. I mean, most people are driven by fear, shame, guilt, stuff like that. It's the wolf at the back side of you that's keeping you going forward and getting out of bed in the morning. And so, if all of a sudden, you know, th three days after that experience, I realized I really wasn't afraid of dying anymore. I mean, I could just drive into that apartment right now, and that would be bliss. So, that was part of what happened. I mean, it gets characterized as ego death. And so, if I'm not afraid of dying anymore, what can the wolves do to me that haven't been male, you know? So what's the point of anything, really? And uh, I have a hard time looking at a particular thing because I mean, there was a motivation that came with that experience which was basically understanding what those inhibitory forces were doing to people to cause pain and suffering and some of it is good for socialization probably but a lot of it is unnecessary And, you know, just basically 
experiencing a new motivational structure that had to do with what can we do to alleviate suffering and basically bring about a different kind of society ordered in a different way than the one I had grown up in. I mean, I kind of grew up in with the attitude towards the world of what have I done to deserve to be born into this place, you know? It must have been really bad. <laughs> so, if you, from that motivational shift that kept me going, I really was just eating everything up. Went through lots of different books. I mean, basically, psychology, philosophy, physics, and religion are all tangled up in one kind of a knot that are all interconnected with each other. And that we, it's a wiring Christmas light maze, not partly, but how do we untangle it and, and understand it rather than just say, no, this is outside our ability to deal with. And in that, in reading that material, I wanted to, it's a person that I've been interacting with online before I had that sudden change was somebody who had been involved with the man who wrote a book on synchronicity, plus this is a person I'd never met but who were online from a support group. Had, she recommended that I agree, she said she had an experience like this through a Sufi tradition when she was like 18 and so she could relate to what I was explaining to her. He's like asking her, can you just suddenly be bipolar, you know, or something extreme like that? And she said, well, it's this other thing. Anyway, she recommended I read Carl Jung and his ideas on individuation, which I did. And I had to stop after a while because I started having, like, all these number synchronicities jumping out at me. And I had some really strange dreams tied in with, Five, five, five on the clock when I woke up that were like archetypal. One was about self-acceptance. Another one was about basically the creation of the universe from God's perspective, which was at that point I said, who makes up these stories? And I've got to stop reading Carl Jung for a while, <laughs> you know, because this is bizarre. You know, I don't believe in this stuff. I'm pretty materialistic and don't believe, anyway, Carl Jung talks a lot about the collective unconscious and archetypal things, and he definitely convinced me. But at one point, I did that simple example, was at one point I was dealing with facing surgery for prostate cancer, and I was kind of stressed about it, and trying to get everything done prior to that and caught up, and I had a, just a big 333 three, three came into my dream while I was asleep to the point where it startled me awake and then I turned over and I looked at the clock and it was 333 three, three on my digital clock. It was pretty, either I've got a really good internal clock or that's, that's pretty strange synchronicity. So somehow we have to be able to integrate that kind of weird experience with our normal materialist perspective of the, of the world. And it's kept me motivated to keep pushing that way because I think there's something that better that we can do, you know, and it falls in the realm of transhumanism. And one of the people I, I got into trying to understand was Alan Turing and his work with decidability and, and computing machinery, and universal computing machinery, because I know he was interested in consciousness and the more I tried to understand where he was coming from, the more I really got interested in the notion of Bill, you know, could there be conscious machinery Bill, you know, something, and what's the, what's the essential requirements for even basic consciousness, not just this weird stuff I was trying to figure out, but the underlying what is consciousness? I've been to 
since about 2012, I started going to Science of Culture since then in Tucson. And I've been to there's something called Science and Non-Duality where it's safe to talk about weird stuff like this and not get locked up in the funny farm. <laughs> <laughs> there's all sorts of other people who've had similar experiences. And actually just talking to people in my own family, they say, yeah, something weird happened to your cousin and he was trying to give all of his stuff away. And I said, that sounds a lot like this kind of experience because you, once you lose your sense of self, then everything just belongs to everybody. It's a communal kind of consciousness. You're looking out for the collective. And there, as I can tell, it's a fairly natural evolution of consciousness towards through, through an individuation path. Both Carl Rogers and others have reported that it was just a natural stage of development. That if you get to a certain point, you will have a kind of shift like that where you just naturally shift into a kind of consciousness that's more concerned with the collective than the individual self. And, you know, if you look at it from an evolutionary point of view, as we pass child, humans live past child bearing years quite a bit by now. So then what's the purpose of those people and the mentoring? But, but hopefully they, they're the ones who've evolved to the point where they can give guidance to younger people and be selfless in that giving. And they can do a better job if my third feeling does it. You know, the individuation of developing a strong sense of self is really important for a robust distributed system where there's lots of individuals. There needs to be a good horizontal foundation of strong individuals to create the, the kind of society that we want to move towards for a free, a free society. It needs the foundation of the American dream. So, I, two years ago, I was preparing for a talk down in San Diego, or San Jose, or yeah, I ended up being in La Jolla. I came across the idea of dual aspect monism, which put into words something that I'd sort of been trying to figure out how to express. And if you look at the, I mean, scientists measure brain waves and what's going on in the brain with electrical signals typically, or there's chemical neurotransmitters involved in the process, but the question comes up of causality, what's the, so is that, are those brain waves in any way driven by consciousness or are they producing consciousness? Or what's the causality, which is, is there was one primary and the other one secondary? Or most physical, the people who are into the materialist perspective tend to take, you know, the electrical activity is consciousness, and a lot of the theories are based on interpreting that, and like integrated information theory is based on that, which is one of the more well-proven approaches to detecting whether it's like, like a lock-in case is conscious or not. They can tell by now pretty well if that's true, and even given people the ability to communicate by using that technology who were locked in, which is where you can't move anything or communicate in any way whatsoever, and you, you're just there in the vegetative state, or are they? And so, the, In, in, in taking the point of view that you know, we are partly matter and there's this other thing that we all experience called consciousness that nobody has a really good concept of how to, there aren't very many really good explanations out there that are generally accepted as to how this works. And it, it ends up being a, a kind of complementarity if you look at it from dual aspect monism, it, it, there's consciousness and processes that we feel experientially. And then there's these electrical neurotransmitter signals in the brain, or a nerve path firing. And somehow they are different manifestations 
of something that's unitary at some deeper level, if we could ever get to that deeper level, which may or may not be possible. But just whether it's possible or not to get to that level, <coughs> there might be something that we can do to move forward with that assumption. So at the Science of Consciousness meetings, they, they have a taxonomy that they use, and there's about 10 pretty well accepted camps in the consciousness debate. There's things like <coughs> global workspace theory, like Bernard Barnes, there's integrated information theory, are the two main ones I've paid attention to. And this next meeting is coming up. They're going to have a whole subsection on dual aspect monism, which is why I'm liking this talk. I mean, going to this meeting in Switzerland seems like a good idea to talk about this more because I haven't seen that as a separate item when I've gone to the meetings in the past. The first meeting I went to, I, did, I went and they asked me why I was going. I said, because I won't. Well, conscious robots from the future are trying to convince me to invent them. I'm trying to decide if I should go along with their plans. <laughs> and that was partly a joke and partly serious. <laughs> but at that point in time, the taxonomy had no place for machine consciousness. The last one, the last couple they've held actually have machine consciousness as a significant part of the program. So we've come that far since 2012. And people, you know, well, anyway, I haven't been impressed with the stuff that they've covered so far. It's not that, it's, we've had some pretty good quantum mechanics presentations about it. And the one theory of consciousness that the organizers of the science of consciousness put forward is the Orko R idea that this has to be some sort of objective reduction of a quantum process is what defines consciousness and I tend to agree with that to some extent but it's not very popular. Lots of people like Max Tegmark hate it badly and they just want to like Max wants to have this other particle that comes along with the rest of the matter that we don't understand yet that brings consciousness into the system. It works for Max, it doesn't work for me, but whatever. It, it, May, may how we objectify things determines what we find and so it's important to take lots of different perspectives into view and if they're very well thought out there's probably truth in each one of them and the tangled knot of whatever is going on is the way I look at it so I, I really don't like discounting any perspective because from one point of view that's probably correct You know, I mean, as a controls engineer, I, mean, I have to ask myself, why is there consciousness? I mean, I was thinking about this all the time I was doing grad school on that subject. So where does consciousness fit in the machine? And because I kind of view this as machines. I mean, a lot of us, the, most of what goes on in our bodies is pretty mechanistic and doesn't require any consciousness whatsoever. It's, there's a really amazingly complex endocrine system that's all about feedback and most of us really don't have a clue what's going on down there. Uh, the, the autonomic nervous system, I think, played a big role in the, the shift that I experienced. I mean, it, it's like something so primitive that has the ability to override the, whatever consciousness is supposed to be doing. I mean, it can make you just pass out, you know. It's, freeze, play dead, whatever. It's got the override button. You can just shut everything down. So, no, you're not playing this game anymore. <laughs> so, you know, and how do you try to override the override button? So, I guess the question comes in, you know, what, what exactly is consciousness? How does it come into the system? How does it interact? And it obviously controls the evolution of the neural system and the brain from what I see of it as, especially at experiencing that subjective shift. I mean, I was conditioned in a certain 
fair share and guilt environment up to a certain point, and then that shut off, which felt really good. And then I felt, because of my nature being fairly parallel processor, parallel learner, but then I felt, oh yeah, if this feels just good, just think of all that pain and suffering everybody's feeling that isn't me now. And is all that justified? I mean, how, why are people killing themselves? Why are people using pain? I mean, it's a massive epidemic of people trying to numb themselves to this pain. It's caused by these systems. And if we could understand how the material side of the system connects with the conscious experience, it would give us some pretty powerful tools, my guess, is how we could take control better of that dynamic. I mean, nothing else in pain control, but... And if we understood it better, we might not be so judgmental and harmful to other people in our society and realize that you know, they're just doing what they were re they're reacting to the world in a way that's mostly outside their control. I mean, you get into debates about free will and accountability and, and it all gets tangled up in should we be shaming and harming people for being how they were born and raised to be? Even though it doesn't conform with our picture of how we think they might should be. And you can take that to extremes and usually it gets to the point where everybody agrees, no, we don't want those kind of people in our society because they're harming other people. But within certain limits, I think it's really important to accept diversity because it, it enriches the system. I mean, if you look at nature, nature loves diversity. It doesn't, I mean, and we as humans trying to build efficient systems like monocultures and everything being uniform because it's more efficient and it's fast. It gives you reliable, you don't have to worry about getting water in your tank at the gas station, <laughs> maybe. There's, you know, people don't like those random quality control issues, so they want uniformity. But when it's uniformity of people and minds and perspectives, then it, it can be very harmful to the society. So, the reason I really am enthused about dual aspect monism is it gives me a, a way to start dissecting down into the deeper levels of the problem. And one thing that I didn't have a clue about going in when I went to start going to science and consciousness meetings had to do with qualia. I mean, this, the Chalmers was there looking strung out and weird, and he's famous for having this hard problem of consciousness, which I'm not saying that dual aspect monism will necessarily answer the hard question of consciousness, but it might be possible to make some headway with the right framework. Uh, so, from the perspective of a conscious agent navigating the world, that I'm here and I'm seeing images, I'm feeling internal, and I hear my own voice in my head, I feel my body. All of that has to be somehow interfaced from a physical thing into my conscious experience, or it's not conscious. So everything I've got in my conscious History, recall, everything is somehow been converted from something physical into something that's not, that, that can be called a quality of space feature. I mean, it, and maybe you have to, maybe there's a periodic chart that defines all of the different versions of quality. I don't know. I just know that whatever I have experienced has been stored in, in my memories, was experienced through this other language that came, I assume, genetically encoded into my body that, that maps the physical into the subjective. 
And from a scientific perspective, if you start with that assumption, or you know, from that point of view, then there really should be a way to map something in our physics, you know, at, at some level in our body, whether it's at the subatomic, atomic, you know, the quantum process, whether it's a molecular scale thing. I got that on the next slide. <coughs> which I call this, this is like there's a reductionist side to this process, which is a scientific reductionist. Your typical science processes break things into small parts and see how they fit together to make the whole. But mostly it's about tearing things into little tiny pieces and analyzing the little tiny pieces. It's like, you know, if you can just get down to the basic fundamentalist little piece of the atom, you would understand everything. Which is where the theory of everything people like to go. But that, uh, there's got to be some level where there is a correlation between what we have as subjective experience and what is going on in the physical version of the body. And it's like a, the ultimate puzzle at this point, as far as I'm concerned figure out what's the right level to find that correlation. If with modern improving scientific methods, it seems like there, there's significant potential to actually break that puzzle and, and figure out what is, I mean, that's where, that's what I want to push at, in this discussion that's coming up this summer is we really should be looking at how we could solve that reductionist puzzle. Where's the correlation between the subjective and the and and what's going on at some level, whether it's network or molecular? It, molecular seems like the most probable level to find an answer to it, because I mean that's the level where the where you get DNA encoding and transmission, and it it seems pretty likely that at the very least it can be stored at that level, even if it requires a more something to do with protein structures or you know, it could be in a topological, you might have to solve the problem in a network or a topological space or anyway. But what I'm, I'm not saying that that would solve the hard problem of consciousness. Because you still wouldn't know where the quality of are coming from. You would just have a correlation between these are the subjective experiences and these are the physical traits in the body that are triggering those experiences. And it still wouldn't tell you where the heck yellow came from or red came from. And, and that gets into metaphysics and I don't think you're going to solve metaphysics with scientific analysis. Right. So, but aside from that, there's another, what I would say, hard problem, and, and that is, there's a integration side to things. The, you know, how, how is the, how is it that our brains put together this coherent, consistent story, moment by moment, day by day, and, and how consistent is it really? Say we don't. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was going to say, we don't. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not so consistent. But anyway, there's, you know, and the people from the transhumanist movement that talk about mind uploading and Mapping the connectome, and they've done presentations that I've been through the news on, and I really have a hard time taking that serious because I don't think it solves the problem of what's conscious. It, it, it could very easily have something to do with how it's assembled and, this, and this, how things synchronize across the brain to create the whole experience that's a unified. Experience is a unified experience. That seems like a pretty 
likely level the finances to that part of the problem. But there's really two separate problems. One is a reduction, just where are these quality are coming from, and then how do they assemble into the big picture? And yeah, metaphysics. So like I said already, I don't really think that anything here is going to solve the metaphysical aspects of the problem because and I have ideas about where that might lie. Like I know Julio Prisco gave a presentation at the conference in India and they're talking about the Akasha record. And I, I pretty well buy it. And there's got to be something like that going on. There's some, there's some collective, non-local aspect of that. And if you're, whenever you figure out, if ever, if that gets explored further, that's almost seems like that's where the quality has to be coming from. Some collective ground. And it also sort of begs the question of where is consciousness? <laughs> and from a mathematical point of view, I would have to say it's in the null space of this space. <laughs> uh, which, which is a pretty vague thing to say, right? So where, where would that be? It's, a, it, it's where it turns into religion pretty fast. You know, what, what, what is the space that consciousness occupies? And if, is there really just one consciousness that origin, that puts the ground for all of this, and, and the quality I rise from that ground is something that I don't know if we'll ever know the answer to. And I was agnostic pretty thoroughly before, and I'm still pretty agnostic. And some things are. Some things we might know, but not on this level of existence sometime in the future. I don't have any particular place on a self surviving death and resurrection and all of that. I don't have place one way or another. But I do have strong beliefs that if we understand ourselves better through whatever efforts we can make towards taking our personal evolution or collective evolution, that we can create a better social world for all of us to live in. And there are other ideas on how things might work. That's off Wikipedia. Some people think that physical should be primary, and mental should be primary. And I guess my dual aspect monism pretty well falls in with the neutral monism. You know, some, as a controls engineer, if my consciousness isn't just a joke, that I can really think that my head should be over here and it goes over there, then there's got to be two-way communication between the physical and the mental. And so that means that some there's got to be some other more fundamental place where that connection is being made that we're not conscious of. But you, it has an effect both on the physical and on the mental. Can you walk through each of the words in that dual aspect of monism in relation to that third substance? I don't see the connection between those. In, in this, they're just trying to say that Okay, the Cartesian duality, the idea was there's the physical and it's one thing, and there's the metal and it's another thing, and they're just separate. Mm -hmm. There's the man and the machine. And that sort of gives, leads to the notions like, that, yeah, there's this soul that migrates off someplace else when you die, or wanders around the world without a body. It's like the two are separate mm -hmm. entities and can exist individual you can have you can have a physical body that's functional by itself soulless 
zombies, and you can have just ghosts walking around with no body, but they're still intact, functioning, thinking creatures. Uh, physicalism says, I mean, it's sort of like the Max Tedmark view of things, the Dan Dennett view of things, is that consciousness is just a joke. You can show the decisions are made in the brain 30 seconds before the person is aware of them. It's been done and proved in the lab. So the consciousness is just a big joke. We're not, I mean, we're conscious, but we don't really do anything in consciousness other than feel pain and joy and think we make decisions that we don't really make because we make mm -hmm. by unconscious processes. Meaning the, the physical decides and then the mind thinks that it decided? Right. Yeah. Something about that. Well, there's another mind that decides. So, like in some of the tests they've done, they're basically like a silent mind within your mind that makes the decisions on your behalf. So, whether it's the material or you know, or idealism, still yet to be decided. All sorts of fun stories. Would that be correlated with the third substance, though? Is that like what's the third substance? Because that sounds like it could be if you're talking about the physical, and then there's another mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, so the, the, this kind of continuum of physicalism to idealism, and the place that most people end up like to talk about it, they end up on one extreme or the other, where they simply deny the existence of the other. Mm -hmm. So, physicalism goes even beyond like all caps matter is bigger than mind, it says mind isn't a thing. You don't think, therefore, you're not. Like, there just isn't a mind. Your conscious experience doesn't exist. You say, what does that even mean? I have a degree that you don't have. <laughs> um, though Daniel Bennett's more interesting than some of the times characterized. And then idealism is there just isn't physical stuff. There is just mind. So, so, so the neutral monism is entering a really interesting realm of so how, how does none of this exist? So, so, so Deepak Chopra comes and brings a contingent of people who believe very strongly one way. Yeah. <laughs> On the other side, that, now basically we're just avatars in the game here. And it's all in, this, this physical realm is just an illusion, and, and there isn't really anything physical. It's all just a constructive yeah, you're thing. Really it's all just a poly construct in an artificial environment someplace else, you know. Yeah. But, if it's, but if it's all an illusion, though, can I just pick a different illusion, though? Like, <laughs> I mean, can I just choose that it's not if an illusion? It if it's all enough, an illusion, I mean, I mean, can we choose if you believe you are creating the illusion? Yeah. We're just not given that good rhythm of needles and a sitar. Some of the stuff I've read, I've got off pretty far <laughs> off into. There's Alejandro Jordorowski wrote some yeah. stuff about about shaman treatments in Mexico, and you know if you are raised in the right environment and believe hard enough, you can do all these weird things that defy what our logical Western minds believe. And he says he doesn't understand it, but he's sane enough to think that there might be something real going on there. So I have to keep an open mind in that direction. They respect his perspective. I've seen his angel. Even just like the placebo effect. The placebo effect is yeah. your mind having a physical effect on your body. And so there is like there is something there. There's something going on, definitely. So and, and so I, I my feeling is that the, the highest solution is going to be an integration of both sides of that. And is, is, that instinct. and is that why it's called dual aspect monism? Yeah, because you've got both sides. And you've got to respect both sides. Yeah, so, but it, it's like the wave particle duality problem. I mean, okay, if you look at it one way, you see a particle. If you look at it another way, you see a wave. But there's only one thing there, so how, how does that exactly work? And so there's sort of that same idea put into the mind-body problem. Mm -hmm. There's this complementary, you've got, to, you've got to respect the physical process and you've got to respect the subjective processes. So how do you integrate from there? And Is that like Schrodinger's cat or something? The cat's alive and dead at the same time? <laughs> yeah. 
don't know if that answered your question. I think, I mean, it explains why it's called dual aspect monism. That was my question. But then I guess the second question is, uh, how does that definition correlate with third substance? So they're saying, I mean, the, in this case, they're saying there's a, those are both aspects of something more primary. Which well, is a third, it's a hypothetical third substance that we don't understand yet. It, it is both be, it conscious be, and it material. Be, it's it has, like a placeholder. It, it's a, it's a proto-conscious, proto-physical something. Would that be like a rock, paper, scissors type thing where they all interact with another? Or like a, I am above everything else and I'm Depends on what kind of God you believe in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. It's, you know, it's in the metaphysical realm anyway. That's what, well, I mean, physics is trying to deal with this, what, 15 significant interpretations of quantum mechanics, and they're all trying to explore <laughs> the way particles with duality problem. Yeah. So I don't know that it'll be any easier. It's like matter, but more refined. So, yeah, and so, it, you know, I in one of my physics classes, they there was an interesting uh, there was an interesting moment where we were we were discussing like the, the size of an electron or something, oh. and uh, it, it eventually it landed on this point where the the physics professor said. You know, in, in this context, we get to the point of you have to start saying what do we mean by size because we're not actually talking about physical particles and are we talking about their interactional cross-section with other particles? Or? Yeah, it's, it's terrible. You do this statistical game and it turns out that the output of it is a distance. So, cool, that's the diameter, maybe radius. Let's say radius of the right. electron, but it's just... That's what happens to fall out of your equation describing behavior, but it's mm -hmm. not a radius. Emphatically, it can't be. Yeah. It's so weird. <laughs> I'm glad someone else noticed how weird that was. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. yeah it's, just the, it's just the fact that a number falls out when you do your division. You say, oh, the unit that's left over is a length. Let's call it a radius. <laughs> and, and where I get to in all of this, trying to make has or tells out of it is so if you get into that paradoxical situation where you've got two things that seem to be impossible they're like it doesn't seem like it's possible right it's just a, it's a paradox you've got it's a particle and it's a wave at the same time somehow depending on how you look at it and what one, one of those archetypal dreams I had after I came back from one of these meetings was I woke up, I, I, I woke up in this paradox, I woke up, before I woke up, I became semi-conscious, you might have to call it lucid dreaming, but there was this thing I was noticing where there was just like stretchy elastic thing that looked like a wave on one side, a wave form, and there was this focal point on the other side. And I, it took effort to stretch them apart. Because, and I was waking, I felt like I was waking up when I was stretching them apart. And so I noticed that I backed up and it closed back together. And I did that like three or four times, feeling this tension it took to stretch it apart and pull it back together. And then I pulled it apart and went through that and woke up and stood up. I was, was awake. So I went from like a dreaming state to an awake state going through, basically going through the wave particle duality paradox to be conscious. And that's a pretty good metaphor for what I consider the fundamental requirement for consciousness, which is both a focal point and the background within which that focal point occurs. And 
that's what, what I played around with with these kind of pictures. The idea that there's two basic aspects to, re to all of reality, whether it be physical, mental, mathematical, that all end up spanning this space where there's this, it's indeterminate, it's, it's the uncomputable part. The, the, I mean, Turing machines can handle computable functions which all end up all on one side of this. And with the advent of graphical processors, we're getting a lot more capacity on the parallel side of this diagram. And what I'm left feeling is that when we figure out what consciousness is, it will be in between those two, opposed to each other. It give, would give us the mental, the right mental situation to be able to handle what we have to handle in consciousness, which is undecidable, irreducible possibilities. And is that the dual aspect? The focal and non-focal, is that what you mean? This is dual and non-dual in one system. And so what I'm there's a unity at one point, and I'm saying that this is this fits into the dual aspect monism, in, for the way I look at it. You, you've got you've got to have the two sides, and you've got to have the unity to get consciousness in the system. You got you got to have the two sides, focal and non focal. And you've got to have the non dual, is that what you're you've, got, you've got to have this, but they, they, you have to have the overlap between them to create the, the, there's a, the there's a diagram to, between, you, I mean, the two the, the, the this boundary is a conscious, sorry? Would you say like there's a Venn diagram of the two and consciousness is where they overlap? So, yeah, the last, one of the last meetings I was at, I guess it's the last one in Tucson, I think. No. Well, anyway, yeah, the last one in Tucson. The Roger Penrose and the or, or he's the or, or was having this brainstorm. He said, "Aha! Yeah, this is what it really is." And he was saying that what he's trying to say with the the or, or idea is that basically there's a branching of possibilities with a single outcome. Well, there's branching possibilities within this space that until the point where they're decided, is what you would handle with a, as a quantum process. Where it's, it's like it would take a quantum computer to do it. And then at some point, this collapses, and then you're, there's only one outcome, okay, on the collapse of all the possibilities. And he's saying, but then if you look back on that process, the time when it would say that you decided back before the branching occurred, which maybe it's 30 seconds, I don't know, if you can actually hold the thought for 30 seconds before it can collapse to a decision, and at which point it's going to look like you decided back at the branching point, just based on his version of quantum and how he understands quantum mechanics. It was what he was trying to say about it. But, so there's, there's a possibility space, and that gets reduced to a decision, and then it looks like you decided back when the possibility space was populated. But that's... Roger has lots of ideas that aren't necessarily all the way thought through to the air. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just something that, you know, I don't have a really good idea what goes in here. Other than somewhere in there, you've got to find some quality to figure out. You've got to figure out some way that it connects with conscious experience. And there's a lot of the molecular structures that we find in neurotransmitters actually have recursive, they have ring structures and they have linear tails on them. 
And so they actually fall on both sides of this, which means they're spanning this space. And we're talking, unlike all the, you know, all the neural transmitters fall into that category. And so it may be that somehow they bring quality into the picture or at least moderate consciousness or whatever's taking place in this. But it's that third substance that's the background inside here that's, that's creating the that's just it, it, It's correlating conscious choices with physical actions and physical action or physical processes with conscious experiences. And you're pointing, are you pointing to the non dual? The, the, yeah, this, this, so the, this boundary represents the boundary of consciousness. There's things that fall outside that in the serial processing, or anything that can be done with the Turing machines over here, outside consciousness, in this perspective. Anything that's done with a graphical, massively parallel system is outside consciousness on this side. You've got to have some overlap between these to get consciousness in this perspective. And that's just mostly based on the considerations that were worked through and decided ability by Alan Turing and and others, church and and this and this Austrian guy, but in the, that makes sense. Very interesting. Is this just like dualism or something? <laughs> I'm kind of I'm yeah, it's easy to get what's confused. Going on. It's like, I think that something like Kabbalah could explain this. What is it? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. I think something like Kabbalah could explain this more. Kabbalah? I'm more into the rainbow than like dualism or something. It's all the colors. <laughs> Well, somewhere the colors have to come from the experience, right? And it's not just black and white. And part of the reason I got interest, part of the reason I got went down this whole rabbit hole was trying to understand black and white thinking, for instance, which is very highly automated thinking for coming from reptilian structures that predate our modern complex thinking. So. Very little consciousness involved, and very poor decision making, and, and it's a factor in our modern society because it's more higher you know, media. There's lots of different sources for this, but I mean, there's lots of control of population through fear tactics and trying to keep people in agitated. Think Fox News, but anyway, trying to keep people in agitated, fearful, anxious state keeps them really close to that lizard brain threshold and they don't develop critical thinking skills properly when they're in that highly activated sympathetic state. It impairs development and once you get past early childhood it's really hard to evolve that. It has this neuroplastic, it doesn't happen in the big hurry anymore. So just what well, is what well, is black and white thinking? Not being able to see the gray area. It's got to be this or it's got to be that. It's, I mean, there's got to be this concrete story about this is the plan of salvation. You do this and this and this and this, and then you're, you got it. You know, you don't have to worry about anything else. Fear is taken care of, shame is taken care of, all of that. As long as you follow the set of rigid rules, a lot of people are happy with that because they have a hard time looking into the uncertainty of the gray areas. Okay? Part of what we need is to understand and all of understanding conscious processes is how we're being affected and manipulated and impaired by things that are accepted as all, all right in our society, like using well, just everything that comes out of Madison Avenue is hacking the system. Advertising in general is hacking your system for their benefit and not your benefit. It might sell it as being their benefit somehow, but they also implant lots of images of what, what you should be to, to be a happy person. And lots of things that bypass what we consider free will and good judgment. If you just buy this, you'll be happy today. So,
So, I don't, like you're saying, I don't understand like, much of this stuff. What is, is there hope that we can like objectively understand consciousness? And if so, how does that come about? Is it like uh, more precise tools or? Some of it's, I mean, really we're trying to do things with primitive instruments. I mean, we're, we're getting better and better, but if things are happy at the molecular level, then you need instrumentation to study things at the molecular level. And inside a living brain, that gets kind of tricky. I mean, they've done quite a bit of work on doing things with animals that wouldn't be, I know people who need surgery that can have something done, but most of the technology that's being used, like we've talked about artificial limbs and giving uh, sensory perception from an artificial limb and the motor control of an artificial limb. They're basically using whatever creates consciousness in our brain as a hack. They're hacking that with something that's, they're hacking into the sub, of the unconscious parts to give that interface. And still, they're still using, they're still dependent on whatever integrates and interprets in our brain. They're, they're using the primary system and just doing some add-ons with it. And it's very similar to how we do use tools in general. I mean, our brain is naturally set up. It's like it's a universal adaptive controller from the controls engineering point of view. It just automatically learns whatever you, you attach it to without any further instruction. Mm -hmm. Very similar to what they're doing with with the artificial intelligence, where they're, they're basically teaching themselves how to play games by lots of practice. Our brain just does that naturally. It sits in the gene coding to do that. It's in the network. Yeah, have they ever tried that with an animal? With what? Like artificial limb with an animal? Yeah. Yeah, this is where we find out the bizarre universal decoder system. Um, so they lightly restrain a monkey, which is a lot nicer than most of the things we do, unfortunately, now in the testing. Um, and they, this is the mean thing, they implant an electrode just smack around where the arm is on the bit of the brain that encodes motor output at the brain level, uh, which is, seems to be pretty highly intentional and stuff like that, rather than actual this muscle do that. Da, da, da. They just drop an electrode in. No finesse beyond, are we pretty sure that if we zap here, it's Armaloop? Yeah, okay, put it here. And they just record, and then they randomly wire those electrodes, they put in like 30 or 40, um, into a robotic arm, and the robotic arm is in the same room as the monkey, and it's able to reach a bowl of peanuts, joy of joys, and the monkey's mouth. And you give it on the order of hours of practice, and it's able to get the arm to not fluidly or really, really nicely. There's a lot of um, excess movement, which is really interesting. It's not very, very um, pruned, but it can feed itself. It's not really. It's, it's insane. Like, you just plunk it down in the sort of appropriate area. And I imagine <laughs> if you implanted it somewhere else that's associated with output at all, you could do the same thing. It's, yeah, it it's like mind-bending. Like like so, like so, <laughs> but yeah, it just, it just learns how to use another arm. It, yeah, it's not part of its body plan, it's not getting the normal feedback that it's expecting, but it can do something with it. And you can train with, on the order of 10 seconds of training, you can train a program to read what the brain is doing. And a person can think about moving a cursor across a screen. And we can decode what that means in electrical signals and make a cursor do that. And again, you get a lot of extra movement. You can't really focus on a spot. But yeah, the brain can just send out useful output with hardly any training at all. It's like telekinetic, right? Yes. Almost. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Now we just need it Wi-Fi, oh, so you don't have yeah. to drill into my brain. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's what I'm working on in my, uh, in my lab. Yeah, nice. it's crazy. <laughs> they, they, they've been doing some 
new things at the last meeting I went to the Transtech meeting they were demoing some system where you could do an EEG from you sitting in a chair mm -hmm. without actually having to have a headset on and the, the technology they're using for things like that or as they evolve it might get pretty interesting. Sure. You call it consciousness. And so would you, would you say that that is conscious, and if it is, then isn't it consciousness the whole way down the evolutionary chain? Where's the line where we would say it's not consciousness? If a monkey could do it, then yeah. could a rat do it? Could a, could a plant do it? Could a plant do it? Yeah, absolutely. Those plants have a lot of photons. Photons A photon could be conscious. Could be. I'm not saying what kind of experience that would be for a photon, but it could be. Well, I'm going to stop the recording at this point. Continue the discussion. Thanks, Jeff, so Thanks, much. Jeff. That was great. Thank you.